Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our very special video on excise duty. In this video, I'll take you through an area of tax that is largely ignored by students of exams and even by practitioners. So if you are able to watch this at the very end, you'll be amongst them. a select few who understand excise duty through and through. So um, in this particular series, I'll introduce you to excise duty. I'll show you what the law says and then you become a pro at excise duty. So before we start, this is how an excise duty return will look like. I'll take you through that into a lot more detail, but just know that there is a return for excise duty. This is how it looks like. There are other returns and schedules that persons who are subject to excise duty are required to file, but this is the principal excise duty return. So without wasting any further time, let's begin to dig into the rules around excise duty. To help you understand excise duty really well, to make sure you never forget excise duty, I'm going to contrast excise duty with VAT. So if you have watched our video series on VAT, which I highly recommend you do, remember we said even though they are independent, you can learn one without the other. But if you have watched the VAT um, video series, what we said over there was that VAT applied to the supply of all goods and services in Ghana, unless exempt, and also apply to the import of goods and services into Ghana, unless exempt. So, whereas VAT applies to everything, unless that thing is clearly listed on a certain schedule, which we call the first schedule as being exempt, excise duty is the opposite. So, take note if you remember, we said VAT applies to everything, unless that thing or that item is listed on a certain list which we call the exempt schedule or the fresh schedule let's look at excise duty we are seeing here that excise duty is payable on the goods specified in the fresh schedule where the goods are either manufactured in ghana or imported into ghana and the fresh schedule gives rates so here remember that excise duty unlike vat applies to a specified list so if you are not on that list, excise duty does not apply to you. It's important to remember this because it will help you ensure you never forget this. VAT applies to everything unless that thing is on a list. Excise duty doesn't apply to anything unless that thing is on a list. I'll take that again. VAT, there is a list of items to which it does not apply. If an item cannot be found on that list, then VAT applies to it. So VAT has a very broad base, right? So if that thing is not listed on a particular list, so for example, when we're doing the um, VAT series, we said um, things like um, table salt, we said educational services, some pharmaceuticals, things that are listed on a certain schedule, which you call the fair schedule, are not subject to VAT. Apart from that, everything else attracts VAT. Excise duty, on the other hand, there is a certain list of items. If you are not on that list or if an item is not listed on that list, then excise duty does not apply. So excise duty had a, has a very narrow base. So there's a fixed list. If an item is not on that list, then you have no business with excise duty. So take note, excise duty is payable on goods specified on the fair schedule of the Excise Duty Act either in two cases, either when the goods are manufactured in Ghana or when the goods are imported into Ghana. So remember here that I'll show you the list in the, in the next few seconds. Anytime you see an item on that list and that item is either manufactured locally in Ghana or imported into Ghana, then excise duty will apply. Remember this, there is a list. If you are on the list, excise duty will apply to you when you are either manufactured in Ghana or imported into Ghana. If you are not on that list, forget it. No excise duty will apply. Now that we know this, let's look at the first schedule and let's see what is listed on the first schedule. So our first item on the first schedule is the, the law says waters, including mineral water of all descriptions. Now here, it will cover even all your carbonated soft drinks. So Coca-Cola, Fanta, Sprite, Pepsi, Alvaro, all those things. All, all soft drinks are deemed to be waters based on the definition um, given to this. So all waters, including mineral water of all descriptions, whether sweetened, carbonated, soda, beverage, whatever, it falls under waters. And the excise duty rate is 17.5% of the X 
factory price. Before I continue, let's define X factory price so that we are all on the same page. So if you look on the right, I've said here that the X, X factory price in relation to goods means the sum of two things. The sum of all costs to manufacture those goods, so all manufacturing costs that went into making the goods and also all profits that a manufacturer takes or is expected to take in relation to those goods if and when they are sold in comparable circumstances between unrelated parties in the open market as is considered appropriate by the Commissioner General. So to make your life simple, X factory price is the price of the goods as they are leaving the factory. So obviously to be the cost of manufacturing plus any profit margin or whatever you add um, as part of your margins for sale. So it's the sum of all manufacturing costs plus all profit margins in simple English. So that is the X factory price, the price of the goods as they are leaving the manufacturer's factory. So let's come back here. I'm saying all waters, and I'm saying here that this includes even sugar, um, sugary drinks, carbonated soft drinks, all of them are deemed to be waters, right? So all waters, including mineral water of all descriptions, 17.5% of the X factory price, distilled bottled water. So this would be your Vortex, your Bellaquas, your Specialized, all bottled water also attracts an excise duty of 17.5%. Sachet water, on the other hand, attracts a 0% excise duty. So remember, if the water is bottled, then it will what, attract excise duty of 17.5%. However, if it's sachet water, then it attracts 0% excise duty. Now that we are done with water and all waters, let's come to malt drink. Now under malt drink, there's a special policy called the sliding scale policy. What does a sliding scale policy mean? It's just a policy that is ensuring that we are rewarding persons who use locally sourced raw materials in their manufacturing by giving them a lower excise duty rate. So if you use a lot of locally sourced raw materials to manufacture, then we are saying that we need to reward you because you are encouraging local production, you are participating in local content, and you are helping boost um, the GDP of Ghana by purchasing locally. So, if you are a manufacturer of malt drink, then we are saying that based on the percentage use of your local raw materials, if out of your total production, you use less than 50% of local raw materials, then your excise duty is at 17.5% of the X factory price. That's if you use less than 50% of local raw material. If, however, you use between 50% and 70% of local raw material in making your malt drink, then your rate will drop to 10% of the X factory price. If you still go further to use more than 70% of local raw material to manufacture your malt drink in Ghana, then we are saying we'll give you an excise duty even lower of 7.5%. But take note that if you look on the right, I'm saying that the determination of percentage use of local raw material shall not include water. This is in the excise duty regulations of 2016 LI 2242. It's not in the act, so take note. We are saying here that in finding about and finding the percentage, we are not going to include water so that nobody cheats the system. It's pure raw material um, quantity. And take note that in 2020, the GRA um, issued a practice note, um, one of nine practice notes. So in 2020, it was a practice note on the excise duty sliding scale policy to provide a lot more guidance to manufacturers of excisable goods subject to the sliding scale policy. So now that we know the, the malt drink and the fact that people who manufacture with local raw materials get a lower excise duty rate, the higher the proportion of local raw materials they use. Let's look at um, beer, stout, and um, beer and stout other than indigenous beer. Here too, they are subject to the sliding scale and we say that if you are using less than 50% of local raw material, then you start at 47.5% of the X factory price. If you use between 50% and 70% of local raw material, then you are subject to 32.5% of the X factory price. If you use above 70% of local raw material in making your BM stout, then you are subject to a 10% um, excise duty of your X factory price. How about those who make wine or who import wine, including sparkling wine? For them, their excise duty is 22.5%. Still in the fair shadow, 
we are saying that spirits so this is like alcohols really so spirits including akpeteshi and um, that's a local for those who don't know it's some local locally made um, very strong spirit or alcohol they're saying if the alcohol or the spirit is distilled or rectified then the excise duty is 25 percent of the x factory price if it's blended or compounded it is still 25 percent of the x factory price however there are other forms of spirit or alcohol so if it's an alcohol or a spirit which is for use solely in a laboratory as in an, a lab or used in compounding a drug then no excise duty will apply at the rate of so here we'll use the rate of zero percent so if it's an alcohol all right but you are using it in a lab so probably to carry out lab tests to disinfect or sterilize your equipment and whatever or to compound or make a drug then we are saying that it's used for a beneficial purpose so zero percent x factory price if it's denatured to the satisfaction of the commissioner general then that alcohol or spirit will attract a lower excise duty of 10 percent of the x factory price Appetition itself, which is a locally made um, alcohol, will attract um, a 20% excise duty of the X factory price. Let's come to tobacco products. Now, the whole idea of excise duty, if you're not aware yet, is, you know, one purpose of tax, apart from the use or um, the, the function of helping raise revenue, one function of tax is also to discourage consumption of harmful commodities. So the government can use excise duty as a way to punish people who consume certain commodities by levying higher taxes to discourage consumption. So some countries even call their excise duty the sin tax, S-I-N, sin tax. That's um, the name in some territories. So in to um, for tobacco products, um, cigarettes attract a 175% excise duty. That is more than 100% plus an extra 75%. It's very, very high, right? So you are going to pay close to 200% of the price if you are running off really. So cigarettes and cigars, um, cigar will um, attract 175% excise duty on the X factory price. Negro head will attract 12 CDs per kilogram. Then snuff and other forms of tobacco will attract 170.65% of the X factory price. This is clearly to discourage people from consuming um, cigarettes, smoking, based on the harmful effects on smoking and all of that then plastic and plastic products listed under chapters 39 and 63 of the harmonized or hs code um, will attract a 10 percent excise duty on the x factory price take note of um, put an asterisk by 2012 because we we currently have um the 2017 hs code um which has replaced the 2012 version so take note of that plastic and plastic products attract a 10 percent um, excise duty on their x factory price um, other products like textiles and pharmaceuticals are excisable but they attract a zero percent excise duty so why someone will ask why is it here if it is going to attract a zero percent excise duty as we look at when we begin to look at the excise tax stamp policy we realize that excise duty or the excise tax stamp applies to excisable products so even though the product attracts 0%, because it's excisable, you need to affix the tax stamp on that product. Then CEDA BA attracts 17.5% excise duty on the X factory price. So this is the full list of items that attract excise duty. So if you did not hear me mention any item, that item does not attract excise duty and it has no business with excise duty. Take note, it's very different from VAT. VAT, if you are not on that list, then it means VAT applies to you. For excise duty, if you are not on this list I've just gone through, then it rather means that excise duty does not apply to you if you manufacture or import that. So let, let's give an example. Um, if you manufacture shoes in Ghana, because shoes are not listed on the fair schedule of the Excise Duty Act, shoes will not attract excise duty. The next is if you provide um, education services. Because education services are not listed on the excise duty fair schedule, then it means they don't attract excise duty. So it's a very restrictive tax. It's just these things that attract um, attracts excise duty in Ghana. Now that we know the things that do attract excise duty, let's look at the things or transactions that do not attract excise duty. Take note that I've said that once you're not on that list, it means excise duty does not apply to you. Apart from that principle of 
you not being on the list so the tag doesn't apply to you there's a list of persons who have been clearly taken out so with these persons whether or not they deal or transact with excisable goods the rate of tax applicable to them will be zero percent so I'll, I'll talk about the list very soon but let's look at the principle around exemptions and then we'll look at who it applies to now saying excise duty is not payable on goods that are specified in the second schedule we'll look at the second schedule and talk and see who is on that list and see who must not pay excise duty then any good that has not been entered for home use from the warehouse of a manufacturer where the commissioner general is satisfied that their goods have been destroyed by natural causes or have deteriorated or have been damaged while stored in the warehouse of a manufacturer and have been securely disposed of in a manner satisfactory to the commissioner general so if you've not entered in any good for home use what it means is you've not recorded or made a valid entry um in the records that you are going to use this um, um, good for home purpose or in the local market then we are saying that as long as the goods have been destroyed by natural causes or the goods have been deteriorated they've lost quality or they've been damaged while they were in your warehouse they don't pay excise duty on it it's only fair that if the goods were destroyed by natural causes or they lost value because you kept them in your warehouse if you can prove to the commissioner general that this was a valid um, deterioration or loss then no excise due to be payable on those goods that have been destroyed. The next is goods that are exported. If the goods are entered for re-export and they are re-exported where they are imported goods or goods that are exported and are removed from a warehouse and are immediately entered for export in the case of goods manufactured in Ghana. What we are saying here is that if you export a good that has been appropriately entered for re-export i'll show you the rules on this shortly but if you re-export a good that has been initially entered and the, this good did not meet some criteria so the goods were either imported or manufactured and you have entered them for re-export then no excise duty will apply if you meet some conditions which i'll show you shortly you just know that for now make a mental note that goods that are re-exported may not attract excise duty based on some conditions also when they are delivered as ship stores on a ship or aircraft proceeding to a place outside ghana no excise duty will apply remember this is similar to vat but vat chose to do a zero rating approach under the second schedule of act 870 so while excise duty is doing a full exemption really by applying a zero rate anyways vat is zero rating it and rather not exempting it right also goods that are removed from a warehouse of a registered manufacturer to another warehouse of the same manufacturer or to a warehouse of another registered manufacturer will not be subject to excise duty. So here, the whole idea is you have not you have not sold the good, you have not entered the good for what sale to the local market. So we are not going to charge you excise duty. You are just transferring the good from one warehouse to the other. So no excise duty will apply. It's only fair that we treat it this way. Now let's see who is on the second chart. Remember, I said that excise duty is not payable by persons or transactions that are listed on the second schedule the first exemption is the president of the republic of ghana remember that under the vat act the president of ghana is on the third schedule of act 870 so the third schedule of the vat act deals with relief supplies or relief persons so here we are saying that the president of the republic of ghana for him all goods purchased from a manufacturer for his use as president will not attract excise duty so even though he has bought a product that is excisable he will not pay the excise duty that's what it means over here so it doesn't mean he's exempted if the president purchases an excisable product like malt drink or petition um, whatever any of the excisable products sparkling wine then he'll be exempted from excise duty or do apply a rate of zero percent on his purchase the next is government of ghana contracts where the contract is duly approved by parliament here we are saying that all goods purchased from a manufacturer by a person under contract to the government where such exemption from excise duty forms part of the terms of the contract then a rate of zero percent will apply no excise duty will apply in that case so if it's a gog or a government of ghana contract which is duly approved by parliament and this exemption from excise duty has been incorporated as part of the terms of the contract then no excise duty will apply the next applies to licensed manufacturers for them all goods purchased by that manufacturer 
licensed under the excise duty act for the purpose of manufacturing excisable goods will be exempt or will not attract excise duty so here if the manufacturer who is about to make the excisable product goes to buy raw materials that raw material he buys for the purpose of manufacturing which good will end up attracting excise duty will the raw material will not attract excise duty so let's say someone who wants to make bottled water if he acquires the raw material which is the plastic bottle to put the water in that is his raw material is going into making the bottled water all things being equal that should not attract excise duty because he's going to use it to make a product which will end up attracting excise duty same for those who make the beer and then all of those the malted drinks for them if they go and buy the sugar the wheat barley and whatever because they are buying those things for the purpose of manufacturing the items will not attract excise duty at the point they are buying however when they manufacture and then they sell the excise duty applies at that point also diplomatic missions for them all goods that they are that are purchased for the official use of any commonwealth or foreign embassy mission or consulate to be exempt um, or given a zero rate of excise duty if you go to VAT, these persons rather get a relief treatment of VAT. Also, all goods purchased for the use of a permanent member of a diplomatic service of any commonwealth or foreign country exempted by the Minister Responsible for Foreign Affairs will also um, be exempted from excise duty. Now, same with reference to the diplomatic mission, guys. A similar privilege must be accorded by that country to the Ghana rep in that country for this to apply. So similar to the, the rule under VAT for the transaction to be deemed as a relief supply. We are saying that here, to be fair, in their country, they should also be given the Ghanaian representative there a similar exemption for this exemption to be enjoyed by the diplomatic persons in Ghana. We are trying to get equivalence treat me fair in your country and i'll give you a similar treatment in ghana the next is all goods purchased by personnel engaged by an international agency or in a technical assistance scheme where the terms of the agreement made with the government of ghana include exemption from excise duty and duly approved by parliament so here too under any agreement with an international agency or under a technical assistance scheme where parliament has approved excise duty will not apply finally for non-domestic goods or all goods that are re-exported they will not attract excise duty at all so these are the things um, excise duty will not apply to or on let's look at since we've been talking about re-export let's look at the very 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 important rules around temporary importation of goods as the name implies you are importing goods into ghana but that importation is temporary the goods will not be here forever so what do we need to know under this? By saying the Commissioner General may grant permission for a person to import excisable goods without payment of excise duty where the Commissioner General is satisfied that something happens. I'll take this again. If you remember when we started, we said excise duty is payable on all goods listed on the first shadow, the list I showed you. If those goods are either manufactured in Ghana or what imported in, into Ghana, we are saying that it is possible for you to import items on that list and not pay excise duty if you satisfy some conditions. And I'll talk about that now. So, where the Commissioner General is satisfied that the goods to be imported are for purposes of further processing or exhibition. So, you are bringing them into Ghana only to further process them or for exhibition purposes like. Um, trade fairs or any exhibition for the purpose of showing the public marketing but not to make a sale and you will have the plan of re-exporting the item within three months from the date of importation or from the date of being granted permission so if you're importing the goods and the purpose of the importation is to further process them in ghana and then later re-export within three months or to just do an exhibition in ghana but not sell it and re-export within three months then you will not pay excise duty upon importation so temporary importation remember that the timeline is what three months if you import for the purpose of further processing or exhibition and you re-export it within three months from being granted the permission then no excise duty is payable however a person granted permission under this temporary importation rule is required to provide something called a bond or a security to cover an amount equal to the excise duty payable on the goods so here 
we will find or will compute how much excise duty you would have paid on that good if the temporary importation did not apply. Then you are required to give us a bond or security. It's like a collateral to secure the amount in case you do not follow the condition of re-exporting within three months. Then we've not lost the tax revenue. We collect our money, right? So you just provide a bond or security in such a circumstance. Then we are saying the Commissioner General shall retain the bond or security where goods imported are not re-exported within the specified period, which is what, three months. So if you flout the three month rule and you still keep the goods in Ghana or you end up selling it, then the bond you deposited will be retained by the Commissioner General. You lose your money. However, where the goods are re-exported within the three month period, then the Commissioner General will cancel the bond or security provided and then he'll give your money back to you. So give us a deposit, if you do not re um, re-export the goods within three months, you lose your money. If you do, then we cancel the bond and we return your funds to you. So remember, this is the rule around temporary importation of goods. How about the rules around goods that are not accounted for? Here we are saying the manufacturer is required to notify the Commissioner General of a discrepancy in goods between the actual inventory and the recorded inventory of the manufacturer within seven days of becoming aware of the discrepancy. So if you have, remember that any goods you manufacture, in fact, in practice at your factory, you will have a Ghana Revenue Authority official stationed at your factory to ensure that all your manufacturing, um, whatever, whatever you manufacture is properly accounted for. Whatever is leaving your factory, we have properly reconciled. If you are required to, um, actually are required to um, affix an excise tax stamp on the product that has been done before the goods will leave your factory or your warehouse. So you are required to tell the Commissioner General if there's a discrepancy, if there's a difference between the actual quantity of inventory and what you have recorded. You must do this within seven days. What do we mean here? If let's say you planned to manufacture 100 bottles of water and the actual um production ends up being 90. there's a difference of 10 and you need to be able to account for it where has that where has the 10 bot bottles passed them what's happened to the 10 bottles what happened what, what caused them to be lost whether they've been lost they've been stolen so you are required to tell the commissioner general of a discrepancy in goods between the actual and recorded inventory within seven days when you become aware of the discrepancy where a manufacturer cannot account for a quantity of goods manufactured in a warehouse to the satisfaction of the Commissioner General, then the manufacturer is liable to pay excise duty as if the manufacturer entered those goods for home use from a warehouse during the month in which a deficiency occurred. So I'm saying here that you recorded 100 goods or 100, bottled, 100 bottles of water as well your production. You only could account for 90. That's saying that if you cannot prove the Commissioner General or account for it properly within the seven day period, then he's going to make you pay excise duty on the full hundred. So that extra 10 you can't account for, he will make you pay excise duty on that as though you actually entered those goods for home use or for home sale or for sale to the local market, um, whether or not the goods are lost um, because you could not um, account for the goods properly. So take note, you have a seven day period to rectify or notify the Commissioner General of any discrepancy in sales or in, um, in valuation of your actual and um, manufactured inventory. So next thing we are required to look at is the quantity and value of excisable goods. How do we value goods for excise duty purpose? So this is where a lot of the meat is. This is where it gets a lot more interesting. But let's pause here. Um, let's take a break for now. We'll continue in the next um, part two of this video. So if you love this video, don't forget to smash the like button and don't forget to share this video with your entire network. I'll catch you in the next video.